We're very excited to have as our final keynote speaker for today, a man who was much talked about in our last panel. Mayor, I don't know if your, your ears were burning, um, but uh, he was described as perhaps the most popular mayor in Houston's history. And uh, Mayor White's leadership has brought Houston together as shown by his overwhelming reelection to a third term. He uses business practices every day at City Hall to improve service and get things done. He has aggressively attacked the community's most difficult challenges, such as investment in neighborhood drainage, reform of municipal pensions, holding the line on property taxes with rate cuts and increased senior exemptions, attacking crime, hot spots, and even faster removal of stalled vehicles to reduce wrecks and traffic congestion, something that we're very familiar with here in, in Austin. Uh, now in his third term, Mayor White is accelerating work to revitalize Houston's most neglected neighborhoods. And Americans witnessed Mayor White's hands-on management style when he helped lead Houston's competent, compassionate response to hurricanes Katrina and Rita. Before serving as mayor, White built one of the region's most successful businesses. Previously, he served as Deputy Secretary of Energy of the United States, where he helped diversify national energy supplies and save taxpayers billions of dollars with management reforms. Earlier in his career, he helped build and manage one of the nation's most successful law firms. So we are so very pleased today to have with us Mayor Bill White to give our keynote speech this afternoon. Please welcome Mayor White. Man, y'all are the hardcore, huh? <laughs> After multi-hour, and still awake? Or is that just faking it? It's, it's great to be with you, and thank you for having me here. Uh, I got some invitation that was along the lines of uh, uh, reading the tea leaves and what next for the legislature and Texas politics, etc. So I'll actually try to share what little wisdom I have about some of those things rather than give you some kind of big speech or anything like that. Uh, there's people who that are in this room that are more familiar with uh, the methodologies that will be used by the state controller to determine our revenues next year and uh, how the speaker's race may turn out and a bunch of other things in May. So if you want me to be an expert on those things, I learned a while back not to try to talk about stuff I don't know that much about. Uh, and uh, I'll be pretty slim pickings on that. But I will say that it's a very interesting time in the state of Texas, I think our country, and I know in the community I represent right now because people are anxious to get uh, this state, this nation, certainly the community I represent, uh, moving forward. To different people, that means different things, but I think a lot of us understand when a community, a state, a nation is standing still or just playing defense. You know what I mean? And the sense that we're working towards progress, that we're more competitive in education, that we're not just taking whatever energy price some uh, foreign consortium will set, the sense that uh, Americans and not terrorists will be dictating our agenda, a uh, sense that uh, we have the financial discipline in order that we don't have to rely on the Chinese or anybody else to bail us out. Uh, these are things where people know the difference between uh, where we've been and where most people want to go. So I think there's an op opportunity here. And you saw that in campaigns waged by very talented presidential candidates in both parties, where both of them were for change. Hey, when you have candidates as talented as Senator McCain and Senator Obama, and they're both making change the uh, cornerstone for their campaign, you know there is somebody out there who wants to move forward, right? We do have a national consensus on that. We know that it won't be easy. People tend to be tired of, of uh, gridlock. Now, that's easy for people to say. I've never heard somebody who wanted to sound like some statesman talk about how we needed more partisanship, you know, at, when, when it came to government. And yet it tends to happen. And I'll discuss what we can do to avoid that here in Texas in a moment. But I think it's real right now. I know when I took the job that I was hired for in Houston, 
And we had these city council meetings that would go on till midnight. People would be shouting at each other. We had numerous votes on partisan lines. People would be talking about the agony of producing a budget. Gosh, we've had, you know, 12, 13, 14, 15,000 or more votes since I've been mayor. And I won't even put anything on the agenda unless there's 70 or 80% of the city council in favor. And we find and we pass a lot and we do a lot. Talk to you, any of your friends that are in Houston. We're constantly doing things innovative. How do we do that? Well, for one thing, you make everybody who's involved in a legislative process a participant in that process and let them know that their input is worthwhile. Not at the end, but at the beginning. When you do that and focus on common goals, you'll be surprised. We haven't had a single partisan vote. How about that? Not a single one. Not a single vote broke down by uh, ethnic lines. The city council, I think it was eight to seven, a Republican by primary. We have nonpartisan elections, as do many cities. That's changed since I've been mayor. But uh, now if anybody even tries to make a comment that people think is political at the council table, the peer group pressure is enormous. That the place for that is not uh, at a place where we are trying to do good government and as a result you've seen a response a uh, tremendous response of people having confidence in their uh, city council and the administration that crosses party lines what is true in a state in a city that is so diverse that's made up of people like me and most of us have moved from here from somewhere else in Houston I grew up in San Antonio people can Golden Triangle I think probably uh, more people are living in Houston from the Golden Triangle than in Golden Triangle from the Golden Triangle and many other places. So we're very representative of the state in that sense. And people well, like the sense that people are moving forward to tackle tough issues and getting things done. For what this means for our state in the next legislative session, I guess uh, many of you who know state government know as well as anybody that a principal business of state government is public and higher education. There's other important functions of uh, state government. And I'm not just going to list them off to show that, to acknowledge somebody who'll get offended. But I think most of us would understand that uh, public and higher education is not only a principal responsibility of state government, but it may be the single biggest issue facing uh, the United States of America in state and federal and local government. I really respect those who are in the legislature, the state house, state senate, and the leadership that are willing to tackle these issues and make progress and who understand that we have very little alternative to making progress if we want our future to be better within our great state. For example, I guess you know that, you know, we're lucky to have be number three in the nation in the population percentage of the population under 18. That's pretty good. It means that we have a young and growing workforce, but only if that workforce is educated to compete in a global economy where our international competitors are investing tremendous amounts in education and in some cases getting sharply improving results. We can't stand still on that. We have the second largest number of adults of any state without a high school a diploma. And those are good per people, hardworking, we're a state that celebrates work. We don't have much of a social safety net, and I think that's fine. For those people who are able-bodied, we expect you to, keep, to, to get work. We'll train you. We ought to educate you. We ought to provide some job opportunities, but we're not there to subsidize people who make not working a choice. Um, but uh, I'll tell you what, we cannot continue to be an economic leader as we have in the past unless we want that statistic on the number of adults in the future that do not have a high school education. Unless we want that number to go down, then we will not progress. Uh, we have the second highest live birth rate in the nation, again, uh, meaning that we have a real blessing in a large and growing population, which is important for our economy, so long as that workforce is educated. So we have a lot to do. Now. I don't know what, what all will be on the agenda of the leadership and members of the legislature 
on uh, public and higher ed. Certainly, as I mentioned, just the amount of financial resources available will take people a strong, hard uh, breath to take a look at uh, what the national economy is looking like, how that affects Texas. And I might add and put in a plug, uh, don't forget the fact that there are substantial emergency <coughs> unmet needs uh, resulting from Hurricane Ike, uh, one of the largest natural disasters in the country history where you can go, and I've been to communities where you know, one in 10 houses are left standing and the people are living in tents. In my own city just yesterday, we had an apartment complex where an irresponsible landlord had hurricane damage and a major complex, uh, rather than fixing it, it, chose to collect the November rent and then notify people that the utilities would be turned off today rather than making those, those repairs. I will say that there were 15 HPD officers on site, some of whom were to reassure the residents that I wouldn't let them be kicked out, and some of whom were looking for the landlord. Uh, <laughs> we're not, we're not going to tolerate that kind of stuff. But I want to tell you there's a lot of people in need still and damage from this hurricane. Anybody who was there on that Friday, Saturday night, anybody who was there will understand, and they don't need to be given a graphic picture. It was... Uh, you were in the middle of turmoil. So I know there's various needs. But I think that what you do to build consensus and to make progress and to overcome the idea that uh, uh, you will be able to get something within an, without investing in it, including political capital, that you need to set some very specific goals uh, that people can aspire to and have people <coughs> Uh, throughout the legislative process buy into those goals as well as the various interest groups around the state and by interest groups I don't mean special interest groups I mean the people who are needed in order to make change work educators and I'm not just talking about educators associations but educators organized or not uh, business organizations chamber of commerce large employers small employers uh, and of course our elected representatives uh, who represent the state and the Senate and in the House. Very important jobs. The goals can be built. Uh, I'll give you examples of those goals, which I think that the state, if it chose, it could build consensus around based on the people that I represent, which are a pretty big cross-section of our state. We need a goal, an annual goal, and a one-year, five-year, and ten-year plan to reduce the dropout rate. Look, I know that begins with stopping, stop with people stopping fudging the statistics. Don't get me going on that. Uh, but I'll tell you what, here's a statistic for you. If you look at the number of ninth graders in your major metropolitan areas, not just your urban centers, all the metropolitan counties in your big uh, major metropolitan areas in our state. And those are the fastest growing places in the state, the major metropolitan areas, and I'm including the suburban schools. If you take that number, who are ninth graders, and you compare that with the number of graduating seniors, there are 60 graduating seniors for every 100 ninth graders. Okay? Now people say our dropout rate is half that and they must be moving somewhere. <coughs> They don't seem to be moving to rural areas. <laughs> Our state's population is growing compared to other states. Sounds like Enron. Uh, <laughs> I said don't get me started. But whatever the number is, we ought to set goals. And they ought to be reasonable goals that are not demoralizing, not Pollyannish. And if you were simply to cut that dropout rate by several percent, not 1%, more than that, not necessarily 10%, and track it. Hey, if Walmart can tell where 10 big screen TVs are anywhere in the planet Earth, <laughs> and Federal Express can track your envelope and you can find online, you don't think that we can intervene when that young person doesn't show up at school for three consecutive days and have somebody visit that individual at home. And that's exactly what we've done with the reach out to dropout walks, where we've done where we brought thousands back 
is now being copied. It's been copied while we started in Houston, in Dallas, Fort Worth, Corpus, San Antonio, El Paso. We have our over 100 schools, high school feeder systems in, in my region with multiple cities participating in what my wife and I started several years ago, just knocking on their doors and finding them when they don't come back the next year. But that's just one example of a specific goal that we ought to set. There's various strategies. In 20 minutes, I won't cover them all. But there's ways that you can cut that dropout rate and measure that success. Second, we ought to set goals concerning the increased accessibility for pre-K within our state. That doesn't just mean state mandates. Please don't get me wrong. If anybody's managed an organization by mandate from the CEO or managed but by memo, they've been run an unsuccessful business. Uh, that's not the way you manage things. What I'm talking about is bringing the state together as a team. And some of it will take, I met with Bill and Melinda Gates and went over these things. I mean, uh, they have a few resources too. Uh, if something works and they think there's a public commitment to getting it work, they told me. Local school districts. We have a school district in our area, Spring Branch Independent School District, where uh, it's a uh, uh, majority minority kids, but they set a high standard for excellence, and part of that is universal pre K. Okay, so I'm not just saying it's the state either, it's local school districts have to play their role. More on that in a second. The third goal we ought to set is a goal about uh, having kids, at least at some ages, like elementary school, be, uh, be able to get summer enrichment programs at a reasonable cost at their schools. Researchers from Brookings Institute had presented me with some findings showing the sheer impact of summer learning loss during elementary school age, uh, where you would have kids they would come back in September. Any parent, not probably not the parents in this room, but anybody who's taught in classroom in elementary school knows. I think the, a lot of the parents that are in this room probably have kids that are encouraged to read, and they have some stimulus during the summer reading and math. But for those who take three months off and they're early in their elementary school careers, you're two months behind where you left off when you start the school at the beginning of the year. It's a real simple thing. So our idea was simple. We call it summer opportunity sessions, where we open the schools. I had to raise the private funds for the first year, mostly as privately funded the second year, but it is a very inexpensive per student. Five weeks, enriched, hands-on science and reading programs. Uh, the teachers like it, the students like it, and you know why? We've run it for two years and tested kids before and after. The Princeton University researchers who helped us design the who, who had come up with a program that was the most cost-effective thing you could do to improve kids' performance. You know what they found? A 20% gain. In other words, people went from 40 percentile versus peer group to 60% of the uh, peer group in the math and reading scores on the standardized test. The next spring, okay, in the tests that were taken in the spring based on five weeks in, in the elementary school half days where they avoided that summer learning loss and having some goals that will do that and address that issue. I've just given three simple goals that people could work on and decide on a bipartisan basis that we want to make progress on each of these. Now, it doesn't just mean money. Uh, in biz I'll tell you what, in uh, the, any business I ran or helped build a drilling contractor, and uh, somebody's a pretty poor business person if they measure how successful they are on how much money they spend per unit of output, okay? <laughs> Only in government do people score themselves on how much money they spend based on the productivity of the money they spend. But sometimes you do need to invest. I'll tell you that something else about the drilling business. If you didn't make capital expenditures, you can even defer maintenance, but you were not going to be in a long-run competitive position. And the same is true on education. It will require some investment, but here's my point. It will also mean that we make consistent cultural change in how we recruit teachers, how we retain teachers, how we promote and reward teachers, how we involve how we involve parents within the classroom, 
how we celebrate the success of those who innovate and to do it uh, without striving to, to without uh, spin. Let me put it that way. Pardon me. <coughs> those are some things we could do to improve in education. What we can't do is call a law something like ch no child is left behind and then pretend that it happened. What we can't do is fudge the statistics because the parents know better. <clears throat> what we can't do is fall behind Singapore and India, China and other nations who are having a higher percentage of their population that is educated to standards when we're competing for, for jobs in the world economy. If we want to compete on the basis of brains, we better invest in brains and do so effectively. And Texas, I think, could be a real leader. Already we have some of the finest public school systems in the United States, in HISD and others. Pardon me. <coughs> the mayor doesn't have to run the schools. That's a good thing. They go into crisis when there's too much parochial politics, too much patronage. We have a base to build on, and I think if uh, people work together to try to get things done on, these, on this important issue, that we could make some progress. <clears throat> Finally, uh, well, I'll say this. For members of the legislature and for the political leadership of the state, and I'm not just talking about people elected to serve in Austin, I'm talking about city council members, justice of the peace, school board members. I'm also talking about people our very vital source of leadership that is not elected. The leaders of churches, of labor unions, of businesses. Our schools are everybody's business. If people just think who is governor or who's lieutenant governor, is somehow going to buy in, in and of itself without the ability to build a huge team involving tens of thousands of people across the state. If people think that, then they really must think that central government is more effective than it's proven to be over the last hundred years. There's a difference between leadership and passing a law. And part of that leadership will, will meant to be make sure that in community by community, school district by school district, we as Texans, we as Americans are focusing our resources in the most important places to us. The same can be said, by the way, for higher education. It's not just a matter of those, for those individuals who uh, are employed by higher education. Uh, parents play a role, businesses play a role, businesses play a role with community colleges and making sure that they have uh, Qualified people are teaching the right things for a job and need to be engaged because otherwise you're not going to pass people off to the jobs unless you involve the employers. The role of statewide leadership, the role of elected officials in a market system democracy that is not top down is in part the type of people who have a passion for work hard every day. In my case, in my job, I tend to do it seven days a week, engaging community leaders in what needs to be done. We were at a meeting like that this morning at the George R. Brown. We were dealing with post-Ike hurricane recovery. We have the leaders of large businesses. We have faith-based groups. We have United Way agencies. We have federal agencies. And we sit in, and it's not you know, a press meeting. It's a business meeting where we identify the unmet needs. Sure, we'll fuss at FEMA. Boy, did we give HUD an earful about what it was or was not doing. But it's not just a matter of expecting somebody in a state or federal, you know, bureaucratic system to come through. It also means inspiring people to take some responsibility. What my wife Andrea did in our living room, she started something called an Education Reform Foundation. Had no staff, no executive director, no money. Other than that, it was doing pretty good. And within, and this is way before I was mayor, okay. Uh, and it's when we didn't own our house because I'd invested all the money that we did in the oil and gas business that was speculative. And you know, uh, and that that organization uh, has raised over 120 million dollars 
uh, to improve public schools in our area over the last, say, 11, and, and invested it and tested the results before and after. We're making steady progress. There needs to be a lot of people doing what she did. And a lot of people are capable of it if we set it out as our number one goal. And it's not something we just give speeches about. It's something that people believe in and care. Now, whether I'm mayor or I'm a citizen, or go back in the energy business or Joe Bell practice law, I think this is something that all Texans ought to be thinking about. It really is the future of our state. My parents spent 80 years in the public schools. Uh, my dad uh, grew up on a tenant farm. Uh, there wasn't, you know, electricity most of the time that he grew up. And then we, when he came back, having made it from Omaha Beach almost to the Rhine, and was pretty bad, you know, hurt pretty bad, uh, he did have something that was important, which is a GI Bill. Now, someone with the same GPA and an SAT could never get into the college that he went to because we decided that progress is not as important as it once was, or somebody has. And by that, it's not in any speech, but you judge people by results, not by intentions, right? He met a woman when he was being rehabbed. She was part of a church group. She was raised by a single parent. My mom was born when my grandmother was 16. She had dropped out of school. She worked all her life for hourly wage. Uh, she too had an opportunity because of my dad's GI Bill, uh, then he could take an extra job and work and she could go to school part time, he could go and they got each other through school and vowed to spend the rest of their life as uh, principals, teachers, coaches, uh, surrogate mothers. Uh, teaching young people so that they have a better future. A proud profession. There's people out like that now. Some have been in the business for a while. Some are just dying to get in to teach for America. Okay. Uh, where we have more people applying for Teach for America for Harvard, Yale, and Princeton than we do for Wall Street jobs, which is a pretty remarkable statistic when you think about it. We're an idealistic country. Uh, there's a lot of people out there who are like my parents, who know that this is the challenge of our generation and the next. There's no better state that can meet this challenge than Texas, because we're proud, we're honorary, we're tough, and we're competitive. We don't like to see, we don't like to trail. Listen, I can, I'll tell you, you know who I was rooting for, my UT alumni at that Texas, Texas Tech game. <laughs> But, uh, and we are competitive. But I just as soon be, get beat by a Texas team than get by any team, right? And I think everybody here could agree with that. We're Texas Patriots. And we do not like to lose. And that means we don't want to lose this issue in global, you know, in, in the in global competition for good jobs either. And there's only one way we're going to keep those. And that's by investing in our workforce. I think there's a lot of Americans who get that. I think Americans know in the concrete that the quality of the schools will help preserve the value of their houses, right? Good school, you're near a good school, I mean you have property values go up. I think most people know, people like me know, that we want a growing economy in this state, so my kids will want to live in Texas. And those that could it, couldn't get into the college that they wanted to get in, that their parents went to, because we didn't make enough slots in top tier institutions for those kids to go. If they come back from Mississippi, Georgia, LSU, Oklahoma, where so many tens of thousands are going, we want them to come back to Texas. Now, we didn't want to have them leave to begin with. That's a different topic. But I think Texas is ready, and uh, I just ask everybody here to 
you know, think and pray for our legislative leadership. We're going to face a challenging legislative session. It'll be an interesting national environment, and it's great to be with you today. Thank you very much.